Book One, Chapter Seven of A Hero of Our Time by Mikhail Yurovich Lermontov, translated by Mar Murray and J. H. Wisdom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. In the meantime, we had finished our tea. The horses, which had been put too long before, were freezing in the snow. In the west, the moon was growing pale and was just on the point of plunging into the black clouds, which were hanging over the distant summits like the shreds of a torn curtain. We went out of the hut. Contrary to my fellow traveller's prediction, the weather had cleared up, and there was a promise of a calm morning. The dancing choirs of the stars were interwoven in wondrous patterns on the distant horizon, and one after another they flickered out as the wan resplendence of the east suffused the dark lilac vault of heaven, gradually illumining the steep mountain slopes covered with the virgin snows. To right and left loomed grim and mysterious chasms and masses of mist, eddying and coiling like snakes, were creeping thither along the furrows of the neighboring cliffs, as though sentient and fearful of the approach of day. All was calm in heaven and on earth, calm as within the heart of a man at the moment of morning prayer, only at intervals a cool wind rushed in from the east, lifting the horses' manes, which were covered with hoar-frost. We started off. The five lean jades dragged our wagons with difficulty along the tortuous road up Mount Good. We ourselves walked behind, placing stones under the wheels whenever the horses were spent. The road seemed to lead into the sky, for, so far as the eye could see, it still mounted up and up, until finally it was lost in the cloud which, since early evening, had been resting on the summit of Mount Gut, like a kite awaiting its prey. The snow crunched under our feet. The atmosphere grew so rarefied that to breathe was painful. Ever and anon the blood rushed to my head, but without a certain rapturous sensation was diffused throughout my veins, and I felt a species of delight at being so high up above the world. A childish feeling, I admit, but when we retire from the conventions of society and draw close to nature, we involuntarily become as children. Each attribute acquired by experience falls away from the soul, which becomes anew such as it was once, and will surely be again. He whose lot it has been, as mine has been, to wander over the desolate mountains, long, long to observe their fantastic shapes, greedily to gulp down the life-giving air diffused through their ravines. He, of course, will understand my desire to communicate, to narrate, to sketch those magic pictures. Well, at length we reached the summit of Mount Gut, and, halting, looked around us. Upon the mountain a gray cloud was hanging, and its cold breath threatened the approach of a storm. But in the east everything was so clear and golden that we, that is, the staff captain and I, forgot all about the cloud. Yes, the staff captain, too. In simple hearts the feeling for the beauty and grandeur of nature is a hundredfold stronger and more vivid than in us ecstatic composers of narratives in words and on paper. You have grown accustomed, I suppose, to these magnificent pictures, I said. Yes, sir, you can even grow accustomed to the whistling of a bullet. That is to say, accustomed to concealing the involuntary thumping of your heart. I have heard, on the contrary, that many an old warrior actually finds that music agreeable. Of course, if it comes to that, it is agreeable, but only just because the heart beats more violently. Look, he added, pointing toward the east, what a country! And indeed such a panorama I can hardly hope to see elsewhere. Beneath us lay the Kuishar Valley, intersected by the Aragva and another stream as if by two silver threads, a bluish mist was gliding along the valley, fleeing into the neighboring defiles from the warm rays of the morning. To right and left the mountain crests, towering higher and higher, intersected each other and stretched out, covered with snows and thickets. In the distance were the same mountains, which now, however, had the appearance of two cliffs, one like the other. And all these snows were burning in the crimson glow so merrily and so brightly 
that it seemed as though one could live in such a place forever. The sun was scarcely visible behind the dark blue mountain, which only a practiced eye could distinguish from a thundercloud, but above the sun was a blood-red streak to which my companion directed my particular attention. "'I told you,' he exclaimed, "'that there would be dirty weather today. We must make haste, or perhaps it will catch us on Mount Krestov. Get on!' he shouted to the drivers. Chains were put under the wheels in place of drags, so that they should not slide. The drivers took the horses by the reins, and the descent began. On the right was a cliff, on the left a precipice, so deep that an entire village of Osets at the bottom looked like a swallow's nest. I shuddered as the thought occurred to me that often in the depth of night, on that very road where two wagons could not pass, a courier drives some ten times a year without climbing down from his rickety vehicle. One of our drivers was a Russian peasant from Yaroslavl, the other an Osset. The latter took out the leaders in good time and led the shaft horse by the reins, using every possible precaution, but our heedless compatriot did not even climb down from his box. I remarked to him that he might put himself out a bit, at least in the interests of my portmanteau, for which I had not the slightest desire to clamber down into the abyss. He answered, "'Eh, master, with the help of heaven we shall arrive as safe and sound as the others. It's not our first time, you know.' And he was right. We might just as easily have failed to arrive at all, but arrive we did, for all that, and if people would only reason a little more, they would be convinced that life is not worth taking such a deal of trouble about. Perhaps, however, you would like to know the conclusion of the story of Biela. In the first place, this is not a novel, but a collection of traveling notes, and consequently I cannot make the staff captain tell the story sooner than he actually proceeded to tell it. Therefore, you must wait a bit, or, if you like, turn over a few pages, though I do not advise you to do the latter, because the crossing of Mount Krestov, or as the erudite Gamba calls it, Le Mont Saint Christophe, it is worthy of your curiosity. Well, then, we descended Mount Gut into the Chertov Valley. There's a romantic designation for you. Already you have a vision of the evil spirit's nest amid the inaccessible cliffs, but you are out of your reckoning there. The name Chertov is derived from the word Cherta, boundary line, not from Chort, devil because at one time the valley marked the boundary of Georgia. We found it choked with snowdrifts, which reminds us rather vividly of Saratov, Tambov, and other charming localities of our fatherland. Look, there is Krestov, said the staff captain, when we had descended into the Chertov Valley, as he pointed out a hill covered with a shroud of snow. Upon the summit stood out the black outline of a stone cross, and past it led an all but imperceptible road, which travellers use only when the side road is obstructed with snow. Our drivers, declaring that no avalanches had yet fallen, spared the horses by conducting us round the mountain. At a turning we met four or five Ossets, who offered us their services, and catching hold of the wheels proceeded, with a shout, to drag and hold up our cart, and indeed it is a dangerous road. On the right were masses of snow hanging above us, and ready, it seemed, at the first squall of wind to break off and drop into the ravine. The narrow road was partly covered with snow, which in many places gave way under our feet, and in others was converted to ice by the action of the sun by day and the frosts by night, so that the horses kept falling, and it was with difficulty that we ourselves made our way. On the left yawned a deep chasm, through which rolled a torrent, now hiding beneath a crust of ice, now leaping and foaming over the black rocks. In two hours we were barely able to double Mount Krestov. Two versts in two hours! Meanwhile the clouds had descended, hail and snow fell, the wind, bursting into the ravines, howled and whistled like nightingale the robber. Soon the stone cross was hidden in the mist the billows of which, in ever denser and more compact masses, rushed in from the east. Concerning that stone cross, by the way, there exists the strange, 
but widespread tradition that it had been set up by the Emperor Peter I when traveling through the Caucasus. In the first place, however, the Emperor went no farther than Dagestan, and in the second place there is an inscription in large letters on the cross itself to the effect that it had been erected by the order of General Ermolov, and that, too, in the year 1824. Nevertheless, the tradition has taken such firm root, in spite of the inscription, that really you do not know what to believe, the more so as it is not the custom to believe inscriptions. To reach the station of Kobe, we still had to descend about five versts across ice-covered rocks and plashy snow. The horses were exhausted. We were freezing. The snowstorm droned with ever-increasing violence, exactly like the storms of our own northern land only its wild melodies were sadder and more melancholy. O oh, exile, I thought, thou art weeping for thy wide free steps. There mayest thou unfold thy cold wings, but here thou art stifled and confined like an eagle beating its wings with a shriek against the grating of his iron cage. A bad lookout, said the staff captain. Look, there's nothing to see all around but mist and snow. At any moment we may tumble into an abyss or stick fast in a cliff, and a little lower down I dare say that the Baidara has risen so high that there's no getting across it. Oh, this Asia, I know it, like people, like rivers, there's no trusting them at all. The drivers, shouting and cursing, belabored the horses, which snorted, resisted obstinately, and refused to budge on any account, notwithstanding the eloquence of the whips. Your Honor! one of the drivers said to me at length. You see, we will never reach Kobe today. Won't you give orders to turn to the left while we can? There is something back yonder on the slope, probably huts. Travelers always stop there in bad weather, sir, they say, he added, pointing to the Osets. That they will lead us there, if you will give them a tip. I know that, my friend, I know that, without your telling me, said the staff captain. Oh, these beasts, they are delighted to seize any pretext for extorting a tip. You must confess, however, I said, that we should be worse off without them. Just so, just so, he growled to himself. I know them well, these guides. They sent out by instinct a chance of taking advantage of people, as if it was impossible to find the way without them. Accordingly, we turned aside to the left, and somehow or other, after a good deal of trouble, we made our way to the wretched shelter, which consisted of two huts, built of stone slabs and rubble, surrounded by a wall of the same material. Our ragged hosts received us with alacrity. I learned afterwards that the government supplies them with money and food, upon condition that they put up travelers who are overtaken by storm. End of Book One, Chapter Seven Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com